Hello physics students. In this video, we'll be beginning our next topic, circuits. And in this topic, we're going to be moving away from a lot of the heavy analysis that we did with fields. Like in a lot of the stuff we studied, we were thinking about three-dimensional space, what was happening to the electric field in all these regions, X, Y, Z, and then at a point somewhere in three dimensions, we were thinking even about the three dimensions of the electric field. So it was like we were thinking three-dimensionally within a three-dimensional thought process. Very difficult and abstract. And if you've made it this far, you should congratulate yourself. This stuff is not easy. But we're going to, as I say, move away from that a little bit into circuits. And the reason for that it's, is that um, you cannot understand the next series of fields that we're going to be studying, magnetic field, without understanding electric current, because that's what produces magnetic field. So here we are, circuits. It's going to be more intuitive, kind of more about flows and a lot more algebraic stuff than the three-dimensional calculus stuff. So we're going to start with the most basic circuit we can imagine to see how uh, we can extend the idea of electric field and electrons and how they behave in an electric circuit. So what I have here are three C batteries connected in series. We're going to see later that that ups the voltage to 1.5, 1.5, 1.0, or 4.5 volts, okay, 3 times 1.5. And then I'm going to create a little uh, circuit out of this with a simple loop of these batteries, wires, and this light bulb. When I close this, the light comes on, indicating that there's current flowing through the light bulb because the filament's heating up. I talked about this in the capacitor unit. But instead of passing the current directly to the bulb, what I'm going to do is now make it go through this aluminum bar instead. And you see that the electricity flows through this big, thick aluminum bar with ease. That's why it's a conductor. But that must mean the electrons are continuously moving in this bar to keep this light on. And what would cause them to move? Well, the battery is one way to say it. But if you think about it, they would not move without a force. And there wouldn't be a force on a charge without electric field. So we come to the first thing that's not true in this topic that, uh, in terms of what we studied before. We learned before a conductor in static equilibrium had zero electric field in it. No longer true. Otherwise, the charge will not keep continuously moving like it does when I go like this. There is an electric field in this aluminum bar. It's not zero anymore. So, let's, let me get this out of the way because well, I think this is probably not in the way. But, so, the first thing, what creates or maintains that current flow? You need a potential difference Said another way, a voltage. So we used a battery. A battery, as I mentioned several times already in this course, it maintains the electrical flow through chemical reactions. Some molecule wants an electron, the other one wants to give it up, and then that transfer goes through the wires. So it's represented in a circuit like this. Uh, I mentioned this already several times. Four bars, big, small, big, small. The big side here is considered the positive end of the battery, the small, the negative end of the battery. What happens is the negative end releases electrons and this one draws them in. For every single electron that comes out of this end of the battery, one goes in that side. So it's never like becoming charged one way or another. It's always neutral. It's an equal flow. That's true of electric circuits. Now the battery, of course, we, we know they may make a voltage. Again, a voltage is down to one single atom. The one reaction of a single molecule in here is one and a half volts. Thousands of them together, also one and a half volts. It's the joules per coulomb on a single electron. That's the voltage, okay? But also another definition for voltage is the electric field integrated over a path, or if the electric field is constant, ED. So the battery maintains an electric field within the conductors. 
So in a current carrying conductor, here's a little diagram. The battery maintains the electric field. The electrons go against the electric field. They feel a force this way. So they're coming in this side and coming out that side. The electric field in the wire, you could find it by measuring the voltage from one end of the wire to the other and dividing by the length of the wire and you will not get zero anymore because of the battery. So that's the first point. So let me give you a moment to jot this down if you need to. Okay, the next thing. So we know this already potential difference. We talked about it before. But the new idea, one new idea today is the idea of current, okay? First of all, the symbol we give for current is either capital I or lowercase i. It's used either way, so you'll just be prepared to see either one. Here's the definition. It's the derivative of the charge per time. So it's kind of like a velocity, meters per second, but for charge, for coulombs per second, how fast the charge is flowing through a circuit. Or if you want to, you could convert this just to an algebraic expression. It's the coulombs per second. So how many coulombs every second pass a given point in a wire? Coulomb, you could say the current, I have a cool current of 10 coulombs per second. That's fine, it's correct. Or you can rename the current 10 amps. And the symbol for that is A. So that's the first uh, mathematical thing for today. But there's other things about the current that you need to know conceptually. First of all, it's not a nice even flow like a gentle flow in the river with water. It's pretty chaotic. The electron, if it's starting here, it's going all over the place because of the random motion, the thermal effects of the electron, of the atoms. So it's being jostled all around. But the electric field this way gradually tugs it this way. So that random motion is superimposed with the drift. And so you have a certain delta x over time. We call that the drift velocity of the electrons. Of course, it's an average because sometimes some electrons are actually going backwards at any given time. So it's a random motion and a net drift. So that's one idea you need to know. Let me create a pause if you uh, need to catch up to jot this down. Okay, another concept. Let's suppose you've got a wire like this. First of all, uh, sometimes people use water analogies, I did already, to help understand with, uh, how uh, current works. And there's some advantages to that, but there's also some limitations. For example, when it comes to water flow in pipes, you can have an empty pipe. And if you turn the water on, it takes a long time for the water to get to the destination because it's got to fill up the pipe. When it comes to wires, never the case. They're always full of water or electrons. So it's full of minuses, okay? And then the uh, other thing is that if you put an electron in one end of the wire here, one comes out here, but it's a different electron than you put in. So they all just kind of shift. You could do a calculation and figure out how long it would take an electron you put in to come out the other end if you kept the current running. You could estimate that. But all you need to know is that, you know, it's a different set of charges that are coming out. So the electron flow is this way. The velocity, okay? The drift velocity. But the current I is actually defined this way. So here, let me just write out the principle. I
So the electrons flow in the opposite direction. Now you may be thinking, well, how could you just do that? How could you say, I mean, the charge is going this way and you're just going to say it goes that way? It turns out that it works the same way. Because, think about this. Uh, let's forget about charge for a while. Let's suppose you're dealing with money and here's person A and person B. And you want wealth to flow from person A to B. One way is to deliver money into the pocket so A will hand over dollar bills to B. And B is getting richer, A is getting poorer. So that works, right? That's a way for wealth to transfer over to B. But what if A was not allowed to pass dollars over? What B could do is take out the credit card bills out of B's pocket and start handing them over to A. The bills are going this way. Who's getting richer? B's getting rid of the debt. A is accumulating the debt. A is getting poor, B is getting richer. So even though the minuses are going the same way, the wealth is still going this way. And so this is the same idea, that even though the minuses are going this way, we could think of this side as losing minuses or getting more positive. So uh, loss of negative, oh, let me just say, yeah, we could say loss of E, more positive. And then this gain of E, less positive. So that's how current is defined. But the reality, as I said, is the opposite way. But what you could do for the rest of this topic is pretend that positives flow in a circuit. They really don't because the positives are the protons in these atoms. And the only way I could get them to move is to melt the metal and make it flow. The protons are locked in place. I cannot move them. The atoms are stuck because it's a solid. The electrons are the things that move, but I pretend protons are moving and only if I'm asked the question and test, well, what's really moved? Then I can answer the truth about it. But for all of this topic, we're going to pretend positives are flowing in the circuit. And everything works out just fine. So these are the little specific little fixes that we need about the concept of current uh, in this topic. What we're going to do now is move on to some mathematical relationships between current and electric field and so forth. So let's go and... Move on. Okay, if you needed a moment to copy this down, I'll create a pause. Okay, so uh, the next thing we're going to talk about an idea of current density. So, current density, well, Remember density uh, from just science or earth science, or whatever, it's the concentration of mass. But it doesn't have to be. It could be, like we learned, the concentration of charge. It's any concentration. And same thing, we could have a concentration of current as well. We need a mathematical, I mean, a, a, a symbol for this. And the symbol that's used is capital J. And you're going to see very quickly, <laughs> things get pretty unfortunate in this next equation I'm going to write because many of the symbols are recycled. Like J, we use that for joules. But, and then in a problem, there'll be a J that's joules and then there'll be a J that's current density in the same problem. Drive you crazy, but that's just the way it is. And I'm going to write, and don't write this down yet because I want to mention some things. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, so this, yes, it's I, current, just like we learned. This A, we just learned A was amps. In this equation, it's not amps, it's area. So I'm gonna write it out area. Otherwise, we're gonna really start spinning around in circles, getting all confused. So current over area, that's what uh, current density is. So that is like the definition 
So one, uh, this is, it, it defines um, J as amps per meter squared. It's how concentrated that current is. So if you have a skinny wire and a certain amount of current, the current density is high. If you've got a big thick wire, same current, it's more spread out, J is lower, more area. Okay, so it's like, again, the concentration. So uh, no problem here. This in equation two, N is, um, Charges per volume, oops, I didn't write, want to write V because then you might think it's voltage. Charges per volume, uh, E is the, uh, the charge, like the charge of an electron, 1.6 10 to the minus 19, and V, little v, is the drift velocity. So that's another way to define current density. The more charges you have, and the faster they move, the more charges per, per meter cubed, the faster they move, the more current density you have. Kind of makes sense intuitively. And then we get to the next two equations. If you need a moment, I'll pause to allow you to copy that down. Okay, so in equations three and four, sigma, we used that already just in the last topic as the charge density coulombs per meter squared. It's not in this topic. In that case, sigma is what we call the conductivity of a metal. As you might suspect, different metals conduct differently. Aluminum, copper, gold, they all conduct, but some better than others, right? So um, the conductivity, uh, sigma, is a constant that uh, factors that in. And uh, let's see, you can find this, uh, oh, I don't have it written here. Well, I guess conductivity of metal, E is electric field. It's in the book. Or you could look it up online, conductivity of copper, you know, just Google it and it comes up with a new value. And then number four, another unfortunate, this row is, again, we use that for coulombs per meter cube, charge density in our Gauss's law calculations. Not the same thing. It's a recycled symbol. This is now what we call resistivity. So conductivity is a measure of how easily something, the higher the conductivity, the better conductor it is, the more current you get out of it. Resistivity is the opposite. It's like the resistance effect of the metal. So the more resistivity you have, the less current. I, oh, I do have a, a, uh, a page here. So resistivity is, uh, first of all, it's measured in ohms meters. This is in one over ohm meter. And the page number here in the textbook is page 754, uh, table 26.1, I think I have. I can't read my writing. I had it jotted down, kind of sloppy. So uh, this is the measure of how resist, and E is, again, the same electric field. So these are reciprocals of each other. In other words, the, uh, the more conductive something is, the less resistive it is, the smaller the resistivity. The, the smaller the conductivity, the bigger the resistivity. So here's a simple relationship. If you find one, you, you can calculate the other one very quickly. Now, last thing I want to uh, state is that, maybe I'll do it down here, that equations one and two are definitions 
whereas three and four, they are statements about how the universe works. So these are like, in a sense, like laws of governing uh, I. So they say something, and they say that the more electric field in a conductor, the more the charges will flow, the more current density you have, the faster they will go, okay, with a higher velocity. And, of course, it depends on the particular metal you're dealing with. Okay, so one other idea I want to uh, mention briefly before I do a calculation example uh, for the rest of the notes. So, if you need a moment, let me create a pause to allow you to copy this down. Okay, so the last thing is what happens if there's a non-constant charge, uh, 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 current density? So I won't go into too much detail uh, with this other than I'll state the idea briefly so we could move on to our example. But you cannot use, if you had uh, J equals I over area, you can't multiply these two to get the current density because the current density varies. So what you would have to do to figure out the I in that case is you would have to integrate, add up the particular J as a function of radius. So maybe the current density is more concentrated in the middle of the wire or on the outside of the wire. But what you have to do is multiply this by an area over which the current density is approximately constant. So the dA would be the circumference of a little ring times the thickness dr gives you an area of a little uh, r, uh, ring of, uh, of the wire. So this is j times area, or j dA, giving you the amps in a certain part of the wire added up over the wire or integrated gives you the total current in the wire. So. Just one final expression. All right, well, let's take a look at an example of how um, you can use these ideas to solve various things in a conductor. So let me just make some room. And if you need a moment to catch up, I'll create a pause to allow you to copy that down. Okay, so. Example.
Okay, if you need a moment, I'll create a pause to allow you to copy that down. Okay, so the first thing, uh, what we want is the electric field in the wire. Well, remember, V equals ED, or E equals voltage over the distance. And so we have a 1.5 volt battery, and it's connected to a 100 meter long wire. And so we get an electric field of 0.0. .0 one five volts per meter, or you could put newtons per coulomb. Either one's an accepted unit of electric field. Okay, so the next thing we want is the current density, J. And so, remember when there's an electric field in the wire, it causes current. And so we can calculate that current density from the expressions. Remember, there's a bunch I wrote out. Uh, the one we're going to use is this, or I could say conductivity E, but basically it depends on the electric field. So what I need to do is go to a book or actually, you know, I think I got this one off the Regents reference table. They have, uh, they have some resistivities right in here. So for copper, it's uh, 1.69 times 10 to minus eighth. ohms times meters. Uh, by the way, an ohm is a unit we're going to encounter later. I should have mentioned it earlier. Uh, this might look a little strange to you, like maybe an R because I'm kind of sloppy and lazy, but technically an ohm unit looks like this if you took a lot of time to write it. But who has that time when you're doing zillions of problems? I try and go like that and then it gets sloppier and sloppier the faster I go. So if it looks like something mysterious written out on a piece of paper, it's probably an ohm symbol, <laughs> me just rushing. And then uh, I put in my electric field 0.015 volts per meter. And if you multiply that all out, you're going to get uh, 8.9 times 10 to the fifth and It'll, uh, you could say amps per meter squared if you want. Or you could leave all these units, vol volts over ohms meters squared if you wanted to. Hey, that's fine too, okay? So, um, there, yeah, that's it. Um, the next thing, uh, the, um, the total current, okay? So, uh, what we would do in this case, That's the amps per meter squared, the current per meter squared. Obviously, if we multiply them by the meter squared, that would give us uh, the, the current. So we could say C, uh, J, oops, J equals I over A, or I equals J A. In other words, I equals that answer, 8.9 times 10 to the fifth amps, oops, times the area. Well, the area, it's a copper wire and wires uh, most likely are cylindrical. In other words, you cut them, the cross-sectional area is a little circle. So uh, in that case, the area is pi r squared pi, now is a one millimeter diameter across, so the radius is half of that, or 0 0.005 meters squared. Punch it on the calculator, and I believe you get, uh, oops, I have it over here, uh, 0.70 amps. D. D was, what was it? Uh, the charge transferred in one minute. So now we can go back to our definition where how current, uh, uh, how it, uh, it depends on time this way. The coulombs per second is what the current is. So I could say that the charge is I times time. 
In other words, 0 0.7 amps. Now, one minute, I can't leave it in minutes. I've got to convert that to seconds, which is 60 seconds. Okay. So that comes out to be 42 coulombs. Okay. All right, so I'm going to make some erasing here. So if you need a moment to catch up with any of these notes, let me create a pause and allow you to catch up. Okay, so we're on to the last part, the energy released. Well, we have a certain amount of charge coming out of the voltage. So this is part E. So voltage is defined as the energy per charge. Okay. And so the energy or the work, the joules, is V times Q. Or you could put delta V there if you want. But the voltage was a one and a half volt battery and the charge was 42 coulombs. So that's 63 joules of energy that came out of the battery. Okay. So let me create a pause to allow you to catch up. All right, so uh, a lot of information today. Uh, we moved on to current flow electric field in a conductor with electricity flowing through is not zero because the battery maintains the electric field through chemical reactions within the battery structure. So we could calculate the electric field in that wire by doing V equals ZD, that's you know approximate average electric field. We could also then figure out the current in that wire because current density is either conductivity times that electric field or one over resistivity times that electric field. So we can now calculate from the electric field and the voltages the flow of this charge through a circuit. That's basically the main idea of today. So again, go back, study what current is, all those specific features, and then all the ways to calculate the current density. I hope you enjoyed the physics video. I'll see you in the next physics circuit video.